How's everybody? You sound unsure. Uh, the bad news is I've got way too much information to cover in the message this morning, so I have no idea how long this is going to go. So how are you doing this morning? <laughs> I uh, just want to say good morning to all of you who are joining us online. Thank you so much. Uh, we're glad that you're part of our service today and for all of us that are in the room. I'll tell you what, why don't we just let the people who are online know that you're in the room. Let's just give them a welcome this morning. Yeah. Uh, and you're not required to take off your uh, mask right now, but you're welcome to once you're seated and I'm the only one talking. That's perfectly acceptable. Uh, when God does something miraculous in your life, it will create tensions in the status quo. When God does something miraculous in your life, it does create tensions in the status quo. There's a, a set of systems from which we derive our security and our identity. And when God does something, sometimes it reveals that those are not as stable or as sure as we had imagined them to be. When God does a work, it's astonishing to watch how systematically those things are opposed in our world. So last week we talked about a miracle that occurred in a beautiful place, and today is, is kind of a continuation of that, because in Acts chapter 3, there's a man who has, he's over 40 years old, he was born paralyzed, he was never able to walk a single day in his life. He's, he begs every day at a gate that was known for its beauty, that's why they nicknamed it the beautiful gate, heading into the temple courts, and every day he's doing, he's begging, and, and God does a miracle and heals him, and you would think, a miracle in a beautiful place, everybody would be happy, right? I mean, what could be wrong? And uh, the truth is, is that for some people, the status quo works really well. And when anything threatens that, they respond pretty strongly. In fact, people who don't always get along can be unified when the status quo gets threatened a little bit. So in this story, Peter and John wind up being arrested. They are put in jail overnight. And then they're kind of brought into a trial. So we're in Acts chapter 4. We're taking about a chapter a week right now through the book of Acts. Beginning in verse 1, it says, The priests and captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. So they're actually doing what I'm doing right now. And they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John. How many know seized does not mean that they invited you off the stage? It's a very different word. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day, but many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers and elders and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem, Annas the high priest was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. Uh, this tells you a little something. Uh, uh, Annas and, and Caiaphas, they're, they're very influential people, and their family tree has kind of dominated the religious leadership in Jerusalem for a very long time. It says, they had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them, by what power or what name do you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers, elders of the people, if we're being called into account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage in Peter, uh, uh, of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. 
But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. You know, <laughs> there's something that occurs here. I think sometimes we can read into um, a passage of scripture, a tone that comes more from us. And uh, Peter and John are actually responding quite confidently in the moment, but they're not angry, which is not an easy thing to avoid when you've been seized and put in jail overnight. I don't know exactly what my emotions would be, but I, I suspect they would feel different than they feel right this moment. And when they're given an opportunity to talk about what authority they're doing this by, they describe the miracle as an act of kindness. They don't describe it as God proving that they're valid people. And they actually refer to these individuals as rulers and elders of the people. They're, they're respectful in their tone. And, and, and they tell them, Jesus whom you crucified is resurrected. This isn't a message that he's giving out. You killed Jesus, and he's back, and he's ticked. And you are in trouble. Now, that would be the message we would be tempted to speak. That's not the one he gives. But he does make an exclusive claim of Jesus' capacity to rescue people from themselves and from the destruction of our world. And this is what people really get frustrated about with Christianity. They say, that's the problem that I have with Christians, is Christians say that they're the only way. Well, let me suggest to you a couple of things. First of all, it's not just Christians that do that. Every world religion says that's the only way. And then there are people who, they, they, they feel as though they've been enlightened beyond religion. I was listening to an individual, uh, an interview this last week, and, and he was just so far beyond all the world religions. I mean, he was really enlightened. It, it, it's a wonder there wasn't a halo around his head. And, uh, and have you ever heard the story uh, about people trying to describe God, and they said it's like blind men? And, and, and trying to describe an elephant, and, and one feels the trunk, and they say, oh, it's, it's kind of this flexible, long thing, and someone feels the tusk, and said, no, it's kind of sharp and pointy thing, and someone feels the, the belly, and says, no, it's a big barrel-like thing, and someone feels the tail, and says, no, it's like a little fly swatter thing. But when, if they could just see, if they could just see, then they would see that they're all describing a part of God. And, and here's what I want you to know. The people who say that are the people who claim they can can see the whole thing. Look how superior they are to us blind people holding onto the tail of the elephant. Peter had done something, and they wanted to know by what authority he was doing this. And he tells them that it's in the name of Jesus, and he tells them that Jesus is the only way to be saved. Now you have to understand, in, in Peter's day, the requirement in the Roman government was that you would say, Caesar is Lord. That's how persecution broke out against, political persecution against the Christians. They wouldn't say that. Jesus is Lord. Uh, the priests felt threatened because they, they're anything that, that eroded their capacity to influence people. And so, just please hear this. Everyone makes an exclusive claim. It's not just Jesus. Confidence can flow from your identity rather than your accomplishments. If you're good at something, you kind of gain some confidence for that. All right? How many here does not play guitar? You do not play guitar. All right. How many that would bother you then if I brought you up on stage and gave you one of these guitars and asked you to lead us all in a song? Now, I know there's a couple of you that would delight in embarrassing the rest of us. But the truth is, most of us would not feel confident in that moment because they're not good at that. And so our assumption is, I have to be good at something to have confidence. And governmental leaders are kind of good at the political game, and religious leaders, uh, the priests, they were good at the religious game. And basically what they're saying to Peter and John is, what game is it that you're playing? Where do you derive your authority? What, what is it that you claim to be good at? And Peter and John's response was quite different. What's interesting is that they were very candid and they were very clear. 
Peter didn't seem as though he was trying to prove anything to anybody or protect himself from anybody. He just speaks clearly. Peter answered the same way to the people who were accusing him as he would have answered to someone who was asking what they needed to do to be saved. That is not easy to do. He had real confidence. And real confidence is actually quite attractive. He's not bragging. He isn't calling attention to himself. He certainly isn't ranting. Peter is confident because he's not been shaped just by religious forces or shaped by political forces or shaped by just the family he was raised in or the neighborhood he grew up in. He's been shaped by Jesus. Peter's confidence isn't, I've got this. Peter's confidence is, he's got me. There's a world of difference in that approach to life. Confident people don't have to tear someone down in order to stand up for what they believe. When you hear people tearing other people down in our society today, and they're everywhere, what I want you to know, I want you to hear it differently for the rest of your life, that is not confidence. That is anger. Anger is a cheap substitute. They're just angry. Uh, Peter and John actually refer to them by their titles. They show respect. They don't make any threats. The same Jesus that you killed, he's back. Not for vengeance, but for salvation. There's no other name by which we must all be saved. It's an invitation. Uh, continuing on in verse 15, it says, So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called him in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened, for the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. The rulers and the elders were not prepared for Peter's and John's confident response. He had been respectful. He had been truthful. He had been candid, and they didn't know what to do with that. Our world knows what to do with our anger. Our world knows what to do with our silence. They don't know what to do with our confidence. And so they had to dismiss them. They had to regroup. They, they weren't sure how to go about this. The rulers couldn't deny that God had done something miraculous. They just didn't want that to spread. Think about that. You think that would have been an alarm bell for a religious person. I know God has done a good thing, but I don't want any more of that. <laughs> I mean, who says that? And the answer is they were saying that. So Peter and John, what's interesting here is they didn't resist arrest. They were not intimidated because someone has the authority to arrest them. But when they're told they can't speak in Jesus' name, they just say, we have God telling us one thing, and we have you telling us a different thing. Who do you think we should listen to? And Peter and John are not shaped in that moment by the forces of intimidation or the forces of suspicion. They will not abandon the mission that they've been put on. It's absolutely amazing to me how often when it appears as though someone is exercising authority over religious and spiritual people in our culture, how often it will change their mission. They'll go from reaching a community to help people find grace to trying to get a law passed. How did that happen? It's because they were in a conversation that they felt intimidated by or frustrated by. And our world will never come to know who Jesus is through our fear or through our frustration. It will come because we've been shaped by his grace and filled with his Holy Spirit. And that's what makes the difference in our world. 
So, by the way, this is not just the personality of Peter. Peter's a very interesting guy. You might remember that in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's the one who had a sword, and when Jesus was being arrested, he took a very different tact. He actually attempted to behead the, the, the high priest's servant. And uh, he actually didn't, he wasn't able to cut the guy's ear off. Uh, Peter was a fisherman, not a swordsman. He wasn't good at it. And on top of that, the guy obviously ducked. And so all he managed to get was his ear, which Jesus healed. I heard one pastor sort of say it this way. If Jesus had, or if Peter had been a better swordsman, you'd have seen a, bitter, a bigger miracle. It was just kind of like that, right? But so he's a guy who can get hot headed. And then when Jesus was actually arrested, he, along with John and all the other Disciples, they fled. Their natural personality was to overreact when they were frustrated and then to run when they felt overwhelmed. And our world will not be convinced by our frustration or our fears. By the way, our, isn't it interesting? Our world has a lot more tolerance for Jesus as a curse word than as a source of salvation. You ever notice? You can say the name of Jesus any time as long as what you're doing is cursing with it. Uh, but if you suggest that Jesus is present to save, that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. So the question I have for you is, what forces are shaping you? Well, pastor, I shape myself. That is not likely to be true. Um, you've been shaped by the family that you were raised in. You've been shaped by the neighborhood you lived in. You've been shaped by the schools that you went to and the teachers who invested in you. You've been shaped by the friends that you hang around. You've been shaped by the books that you read. You, you've been shaped in a lot of ways. You've been shaped by the news that you listen to. You've been shaped by the social media that you interact with. You've been shaped by the conversations that you get involved in. I've had several people in the last month come up to me and they've said this to me. They said, Pastor, I have gone off social media for a whole week. And I said, and how do you feel? And, th and they've all said the same thing. I feel better. I said, well, is there a reason you want to go back? <laughs> is feeling bad a good thing? I don't think so. And we get shaped by a lot of those things. Ranting and anger is not a form of confidence. Confidence is respectful. It's clear, it's transparent, it's candid, it's unhidden. A confident person can respect boundaries. Rather than trying to control others, they learn to control themselves. They're able to live within boundaries. A confident person is reliable because first of all, because they're confident, they don't make promises they can't keep just to make someone else happy. A confident person is accountable. They're accountable. They see accountability as an ally. They believe that they're doing what they've been called to do or what they've been assigned to do, but as other people hold them accountable, they can see it too. They don't see accountability as an enemy. A confident person keeps confidences. How many have ever heard of something called gossip? Yeah. How many have ever heard of something called flattery? Uh, I asked a person one time, what's the difference between gossip and flattery? And this is what they told me. They said, gossip is what you'll say to somebody else about a person that you would never say to their face. And flattery is something you will say to someone's face that you would never say about them behind their back. So well, that sounds like a good definition keeps confidence. This is what people do all the time. In order to make a bigger or better alliance with you, I will tell you something about someone else you have no right to know. It's a way to create instant intimacy. And a confident person doesn't have to do that. A confident person is willing to be uncomfortable. Comfort cannot become the decider of all things in our life. A confident person is grateful. It's amazing how many times we reject the provision of God because we assume if we receive it, someone else will have gained some control in our life. A confident person is generous. 
because the confident person believes there will be more and what I'm giving is not wasted. By the way, if you want to learn to practice generosity, start practicing with generous assumptions. It's amazing how often we never do something to help someone because we have an assumption about them that keeps us from doing it. So start with a generous assumption. So if you're listening to this and you may be going, oh, this is one of those talks about self-talk, how I talk to myself, exercising my will, strong will. It is not. I will tell you everything we don't like about our world is because somebody's will has been exercised. Your will being in control of other things is probably not in anyone's best interest but yours and maybe not even yours. It's about seeking God's will and walking confident in it. So, um, I, I, I didn't know when I got into the book of Acts and scheduled this for speaking that we were going to have all the tensions in our culture that we have right now. And uh, this passage about submission is really interesting because Peter and John submit in all the ways that they can and then they don't, they don't submit to the the political and spiritual leaders when they're called to submit to God instead. So an inability to submit to authority is evidence of a lack of confidence in God's ability. If I submit to that, then somehow that will tie God's hands. So there's, been, there's been a lot of frustration. I'm sure you've heard it. You know, Should churches allow there to be a limitation on how many people we bring in. And so, well, we're just gonna we're just gonna do church the way we've always done it because because why? See, when when we set people six feet apart and when we ask you to wear face coverings coming in and going out and while you're you're standing, it, it's not to curry favor with government and it's it's not to become anything other than to try to act in everyone's best interest. And, and I know there, there's varying opinion in this room about that. And what I can tell you is you don't know what my opinion is. I don't believe that submitting to proper authorities in our government can in any way thwart God's intentions because God is the one who's in control, not anybody else. Now, if they said you can't speak anymore in Jesus' name, then I would have to go back and say, well, God commands me to do that, so I'm going to have to do that. And then if they came to arrest me, I'm not asking all of my friends who own guns to form a line in front of me and take down anyone who looks like they're going, trying to get to me. I'll just submit to arrest. But pastor, what will happen? I don't know. Let's hope we never find out. <laughs> Invite God's control, not because it's easy, but because you want him to shape your life. So how can we be shaped into the people that God wants us to be? And uh, I've only got like two minutes left here. So um, in Acts 4.23, it says, On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, if you want to be shaped by a different force, pray a different prayer. Our, our prayers are often just complaints about what we don't like or blaming people or sometimes ourself and shaming. Pray a different kind of prayer. Sovereign. That means, God, you're the one who's in control. You're in control. It, it goes on and it says, Sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant David. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. This is what he's saying. God is in control regardless of how angry people are and regardless of, of what schemes are being plotted. God is in, in control. Is that not good news? Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with Gentiles and the people of Israel to this city to conspire against the holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. 
They did what your power and will had decided beforehand would happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak the word of God with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders at the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after they had prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Pray different prayers. Focus on the sovereign, sovereignty of God. Ask for opportunities to heal and to help. They didn't ask God to strike down the people who dared to put their hands on Peter and John. Give us opportunities to heal and to help others. Ask for confidence to speak God's word. Don't ask for confidence to speak your own opinion. Ask for confidence to speak what God is whispering to your heart. Ask God for those things. Hear this. There's nothing more attractive in our world than a confident person. And there's nothing more threatening to the systems of our world than a free person. Nothing's more attractive than a free person. Nothing's more threatening than a free person. And you should know Jesus has come to make you free. That's why he's here. I'm going to have worship team come out. That's why he's here. Jesus has come to make us free. If you want God to be in control of the outcome, put him in charge of your input. So this is what I'd like us to do this morning. Let's, uh, let's all put these back on and let's just stand for a moment. I'm going to say something and I just want you to say it after me. And, and this is what I'd like you to do this morning. I'd, um, uh, how many know lots of people, are, they, they talk with their hands? And uh, gestures can mean things like, um, this can mean surrender. This can mean, mean I receive. This can mean I release. I, I want you to put your hands out like this. We're going to release something today. And I'm going to say something, and then I want you to say it after me. Heavenly Father, you are Lord of all. Let's say that again. You are Lord of all. Give me opportunities to heal and to help others. Let's say that. Give me opportunities to heal and to help others. Give me confidence to speak your word. Let's say that. Give me confidence to speak your word. If you pray those kinds of prayers, you'll be shaped by the grace of God and the power of His Spirit, and you will become a free person. It's the most attractive thing in all the world, and Jesus has come to set us free. Father, free us in this place this morning. Shape us by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.